Oki, and welcome to the University of Lethbridge Town Hall. I am Jody Galle, Director, University Secretariat, and I'm pleased to be serving as the moderator for another Zoom Town Hall. I'm pleased that in recognition of yesterday being National Indigenous Peoples Day, we would like to play the video of our elder in residence, Shirley Crowshoe, sharing our official territorial acknowledgement. Oki, and welcome to the University of Lethbridge. Our university's Blackfoot name is Eniskim, meaning sacred buffalo stone. The University of Lethbridge acknowledges and deeply appreciates the six gates and that these connection to their traditional territory. We as people living and benefiting from the Blackfoot Confederacy traditional territory honor the tradition of people who have cared for this land since time immemorial. We recognize the diverse population of Aboriginal people who attended the University of Lethbridge and the contribution these Aboriginal people have made in shaping and strengthening the university community in the past, present, and in the future. Prior to hearing our speakers today, I again want to go over a few logistics to explain the process to ensure everyone is aware of how to participate and get the best experience possible today. So you will hear from our President Mike Mann, our Vice President Finance and Administration Nancy Walker, our Provost and Vice President Academic Erasmus O'Kine, and our Associate Vice President Students Kathleen Massey. At the end of their presentations, you'll have an opportunity to ask questions. So many of you have used Zoom before, but again, as it's a webinar, there's a few different options and restrictions. First off, you should have been made aware when you signed in that the town hall is being recorded. As an attendee, your video and audio is automatically off and can only be enabled by a host. So at the bottom of your screen, of course, you see a chat, a question and answer, your Q&A, and raise your hand icon. If you're having any technical problems, please use the chat function to reach out to a team member who can respond to you individually. The chat function only goes to the town hall facilitators and not all the attendees. Once the presentation is concluded, there's gonna be a few ways to ask questions. So first off, use your raise your hand icon to verbally ask a question. This populates you to the top of our attendee list and myself as the moderator will call upon you and then enable your audio so you can verbally ask your questions. If you want to submit a written question, use the Q&A icon. So I will be viewing these and will indicate who's asked the question and what the question is. If there are a few questions that are similar, I will try to amalgamate them together where possible. Thank you for attending and I will now turn it over to Mike Mann. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Am I being heard, Jody or somebody? I'll just yes, assume I am. Yes, we great. Can hear thank you. you. Great, thanks. Uh, thank you all for for being in attendance. Uh, I see we've got almost four hundred people online, so it's great to have so many people here. As we continue to say, we look forward to the day that uh, we'll all be able to do this in person. Well, we have a number of details that we want to share with you on some important matters, including budget and uh, the plans for this fall. Uh, as we move into the summer months, I thought it were, was appropriate that we not only talk about some of the challenges that we face related to budget, uh, but also about the compliments that we've um, achieved over uh, this past year during a year of many, many challenges. Most no notably, I think it's important uh, for us to recognize and thank all of you for the work that uh, you undertook over this past year uh, in terms of moving uh, from our traditional face-to-face -face format to most things being uh, online. This of course was classes and labs, but I also wanna recognize all of the um, activities of our administrative staff that had to be moved online and the efforts that all of you undertook uh, to that end. 
This year, or this past year, uh, while uh, COVID was a challenge, our budget, of course, is a challenge, uh, the university saw its highest ranking in the Maclean's Magazine uh, scoring system, uh, coming in number two in the primarily undergraduate category. This is such a tremendous accomplishment for our university and very much speaks to the excellence in teaching and research and student services and all of the different ways that um, all of you contribute to our students. Student success is, of course, uh, so paramount to who we are as an institution, as the University of Lethbridge. And certainly uh, this past year, uh, our students have been challenged in terms of uh, uh, being able to access services, being able to access uh, uh, programs and support. We also know that many of our students had challenges as it related to uh, the, the fiscal climate of this uh, uh, COVID situation, uh, lack of summer jobs, lack of part-time jobs. We were really pleased that we were able to work in conjunction with our student groups and our alumni and others to create an emergency student birth bursary right off uh, the bat, right out of the gate to ensure that we were able to support our students in, in financial ways. We also launched uh, our Career Bridge, the Center for Work, work Integrated Learning and Career Development. The Career Bridge really brings together all of the different services and supports uh, for our students as they uh, begin to think about the careers of the future that they might aspire to uh, uh, pursue and uh, consider different work integrated learning opportunities that might lead them down that path. We were also very pleased that we were able to um, uh, offer many, many elder talking circles during the course of this year to support uh, our Indigenous students and uh, others. Uh, we had 114 students participate in these culturally relevant student support opportunities, uh, which was terrific. From a community engagement perspective, I want to thank all of you for being very creative in terms of uh, figuring out how to connect uh, continue to connect with the community. Uh, so we moved uh, to creating virtual convocation, virtual play day, uh, community lectures. We raised the pride flag during Pride Week, uh, both um, you know uh, with individuals there, but uh, an online experience. And we celebrated Indigenous Awareness Week, continuing to use all the digital platforms. Just yesterday, we had a number of uh, of um, uh, digital experiences to, to celebrate and support National uh, Did Indigenous Peoples Day. The university also had a number of uh, academic uh, and public initiatives uh, that continued. Our public professor lecture series continued uh, with many U of L faculty members contributing. In the fall, um, a very creative group of uh, university level musicians enrolled in the Wind Orchestra Ensemble became part, uh, partnered with uh, grade seven and eight band students virtually uh, for weekly rehearsals on Zoom. By pairing with uh, beginners, university level musicians were able to reach out even during COVID times. And the Faculty of Fine Arts hosted 98 unique events in 2020, 2021 uh, with all sorts of different and uh, experiences. Uh, there were audiences in excess of 2,400 ticket reservations and an estimated an estimate of more than 5,000 viewers to these different experiences. And we hosted the STEM fusion, fusion event, which provided students and researchers with the opportunity to showcase their innovative research and to network work with industry leaders. And this networking, of course, is very important for our researchers and our students. And so to be able to continue that uh, during COVID was very important. The Calgary campus, uh, as we know, was um, absolutely completely shut down in terms of face-to-face. -face. Uh, we know that our Lethbridge campus had uh, different uh, graduate students and researchers and others on, on campus, uh, but Calgary campus was closed. And so uh, I'm really proud of uh, the Calgary campus folks for the work that they continued to undertake and for new programming. And so um, one of the, the new programs that they created was the Career Transitions Program, a suite of non-credit courses that aim to help workers displaced by the pandemic and the energy industry downturn uh, to gain new skills and support uh, return to work. Uh, this program was developed with financial support from the government of Ar Alberta and the Minister of Culture, uh, Multiculturalism and Status of Women. Uh, the first offering of the program will be dedicated to the employment needs of women who have been disproportionately impacted by COVID-19 and are now seeking to re-enter the workforce. 
from a sustainability perspective, um, we, as you know, have been looking at a variety of revenue sources and, and really no stone has been unturned. One of the unique ones that got a little attention uh, was the, uh, the new signage that we um, uh, developed in, in partnership with Patterson Outdoor Advertising. This um, resulted in, yes, a shiny brand new sign, but revenue for the university. And we had a number of um, really exciting gifts uh, during COVID, one of them from the McCain Foundation, which uh, will go to support graduate students studying in agriculture and sustainability research. From a research revenue perspective, we increased our research revenue by 2% uh, this year from 15.8 million to 16.1 million. We had increases in our NSERC funding in, and in our CHR funding. So it was an outstanding year from a research perspective. And our open houses and, and uh, different student experiences uh, really blossom from an online experience. Again, I know that uh, overall our students would love to be in person for these uh, different experiences that we normally offer, but thanks to all of those in student supports, all of our faculty members who participate in and others, uh, we're able to uh, create different experiences from a web uh, presence perspective that uh, ensures that our students uh, understand who the University of Lethbridge is. So these are just a few highlights. Uh, I, as I said at the outset, I thought it really important to underscore that while 2020-2021 uh, has certainly been a difficult year, um, the university continues to prosper. We continue to move forward in uh, both our existing acad academic programs, new academic programming, new broader community-based programming, and it's to all of you uh, your innovative uh, undertakings, your creativity, and your hard work that this has occurred. So with that, I'm now going to turn it over to Nancy Walker, who will uh, talk us through uh, a budget update. So over to you, Nancy. Thank you, Mike. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for attending our town hall. I'm sure that all of you are tired of hearing about budget, and I can assure you that um, it's been a long year in terms of budget. It seems to be a discussion that we have every single day. But unfortunately, we do have to continue on and um, and um, still try and, and tackle some of the, the big hurdles that we have ahead of us. So um, could you go to the next slide, please? Thank you. So the Board of Governors, which is the final approval of our of our budget, um, approved our 2021-22 budget on May 28th. They also approved our investment management agreement, which is the new agreement that we have with the government of Alberta for our budgeting. And it has a work integrated learning component to it, which we will do um, um, very well um, in the next year. So we do not believe that any of our grant will be at risk because of the, the new metric performance metrics that the government is introducing starting this year. As you can see from the slide, we've had significant budget reductions over the over the last three years, and we have another $5.1 million grant reduction that will happen over the next year. So this is in excess of 21% grant reduction over the four years. The base operating grant per student um, has decreased from 15,200 per student to 13,000 over the last three years. And of course, with our grant being reduced next year, it will also reduce. Next slide, please. The grant reduction is significant, obviously, and it's a result of a, uh, recommendations from the McKenna report. If you can see on the first um, sort of bars um, in, in the chart in front of you, it's the operating grant. Uh, three years ago, it made up approximately 64% of our budget. It is now down to just under 58%. And again, next year, it will be reduced even more. This is a result of the McKenna report that wanted to have um, less input, revenue input into our post-secondary institutions in Alberta um, to be more like BC, Ontario, and Quebec. So after the four years, we will be at, um, at approximately where they are, which is you know, around 50 to 55%. Um, government funded. They want us to have more in income from external sources other than government. Unfortunately, that also means that our fee revenue, which is our other major source of revenue, which is 
approximately went from approximately 28.5% to 34.4%. And um, will likely also go up as a percentage because our grant will be reduced again next year. So unfortunately, a substitution for um, tuition fees, tuition fees because it's a smaller percentage, is only about half that of the government grant. Now, we, want, uh, we have a budget value, which is accessibility to our students. So we are very, very careful about our tuition fees, and we will certainly consult with our students before any other tuition fee increases in the future. But just so that you know that the University of Lethbridge has the lowest tuition fees um, in the province for a comprehensive academic university um, of our type. Next slide, please. The majority of our general operating budget is spent on compensation, which is approximately 83%. And it's about 133 million on our operating budget of 168 million. So with having to reduce our budgets in excess of 21%, unfortunately, we do have to look at this compensation line since it's most of the other expenses are either fixed or very difficult to reduce or just not a higher percentage that will get us to the budget reductions that we have. Our preference is to increase revenue rather than to reduce expenses and, and thus we did have a task force on revenue generation which Erasmus will talk a little bit further on in, in later on in the presentation. Next slide please. This is a breakdown of the compensation costs per the employee units. Our largest employee unit is our academic, and that's 53% of, the, of, the, of our operating budget, which equates to about $71 million. The next is our AUP, Alberta Union of Provincial Employees, of 25%, which equates to about $33 million. Next is our APO group is 16%, which is $20 million. Our senior administration total is 7.6 million and our um, exempt support staff is approximately $1.2 million that makes up the comp 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 compensation, sorry. Next slide, please. So when we do prepare our budget, we make a lot of assumptions, um, especially obviously because um, it's, uh, we have to prepare our budget prior to the, to the actual fiscal year starting. So we do a sensitivity analysis. So this is the impact of a 1% increase. If we increase salaries by 1%, it comes to approximately $1.1 million. Our advanced education, our operating grant, 1% um, is just over, is about 927,000. Um, Undergraduate tuition credit hours, a change in that is about $380,000 and benefits, employee benefits is about $230,000. So this is what we base our budget on and we make these are our biggest um, sort of revenue items and expense items. So this is as the impact of our budget. Next slide, please. So we have a balanced budget for 21-22. Unfortunately, we had to use $3.1 million in one-time funds to balance the budget. To give us, um, we use one-time funds to give us time um, so that we could look at the, the results of the budget task forces, the 21 budget, the 20 task forces that we had, and also to analyze them and have time to put in the recommendations and implement them. Assuming assumptions that we have, we still need to find $4.4 million to balance the budget for next year. This is on, based on assumptions with our tuition fee increases, which we will obviously, as I said earlier, go through consultation with our students and also with our enrollment assumptions. Next slide, please. This slide tries to show you where our major changes in our budget are. So the red is decreases or challenges to our budget. The green are increases to our budget. And then the yellow are one time funds that we use to balance. So the major reductions, obviously we've talked about that are our operating grant of 1.57 million for um, the current fiscal year, as well as contractual salary increases and our credit hours went down a little bit because of COVID. The increases um, were the, as a result of our tuition rate increases and position fund savings, either through terminations or retirements. 
and the yellow bar or the yellow bars show where we use the one-time money. So we use one-time money for um, utilities because we weren't occupying our campus, um, that there was a reduction in utilities, but also we had also set aside um, some money because we don't have actually a full year of operating with our science comms. So, so we're not quite sure exactly what our utilities will be for that building. But so we have to reinstate that next year because we're likely we will be having a full-time um, operations with our science commons. And also we do start materials and services reduction um, with uh, less travel, less materials and services because we haven't been able to travel because of the restrictions on our health. So these, um, I, the one time amounts to about $3.1 million and these need to be restated in 2022-23 when we're back in person and hopefully operating normally. Next slide, please. So when you look at, I know that these numbers are small, but uh, what I wanted to point out is that uh, we do budget for a small surplus in our, in our um, financial statements, and that's because of ancillary operations. We don't budget for a surplus, we budget for a break even on our general operating, but ancillary services needs to fund its own capital and, um, and all of its operations, and as well as pay the university. It contributes um, for all the services, whether that's be HR, or finance, um, receiving facilities. So they do contribute to our operating fund. So that is where the small surplus um, results from. We also have our endowment contributions, which we have to capitalize on, and accounting um, principles require us to record that as a surplus. So we do budget for 21-22 for a very small modest of $1.3 million. Um, the impact of COVID on 2021 was $6.9 million. Most of that was in our ancillary services, whether that be our housing, food services, and parking. And this is very typical of all other post-secondary institutions that the largest hit um, operations with were our, our revenue generation operations. Next slide, please. So our, I mentioned earlier that um, we have to, our, our budget deficit is actually projected at about $7 million. But with our budget assumptions for tuition and enrollment increases, as well as some contractual um, increases um, that we um, anticipate that the, the budget that we will have um, to find is about $4.4 million. And we hope to find that through the budget task forces or the revenue generation. Next slide, please. The majority, unfortunately, when I talked about for the workforce reductions, the majority of positions reductions have been in the non-academic side. Um, I would like to, um, because we do have a budget value of people and people are very important for us. And I mentioned that we would rather balance our budget through revenue increases than expenditure reductions. So we do not, we are not anticipating any position abolishments over the next few months. And we are going to try and avoid those as much as possible. Next slide, please. So we have risks when we make assumptions for our budget and the, the for the, in terms of the risks, we have used the $3.1 million for one-time funds. So we have to reinstate those for next year. So that adds to the, to the budget. We also have COVID. Um, we, hope, we hope that we are the most difficult time. And again, I said that $6.9 million was the impact, financial impact in last year's budget. Our opportunities are revenue generation. And I think that there's some great, fabulous revenue generation opportunities as well as the transformational budget task forces that we had that I think that there are opportunities to grow our institution to make it better and still achieve a balanced budget. Next slide, please. This is our statement of operations on our financial statements at the end of the fiscal year, which was March 31st, 2021. You will notice we will have an, uh, a deficit operating um, balance of about $1 million in our last fiscal year. This is a result of COVID as well as our ancillary services. And this is, we haven't had um, a deficit in that um, since 2009 uh, was the last time we had a very small deficit on our operating statement at that, at that point. 
So that is, um, again, as a result of COVID and our ancillary services. Thank you very much for, uh, for allowing me an opportunity to uh, discuss the budget. I'm now going to turn it over to uh, Dr. Erasmus O'Kine, and he's going to talk a little bit about the transformation. Thank you, Nancy, and thank, good afternoon, all of you. Nancy has given us the budget reality. Before then, our president, Mike Mann, spoke to activities and achievements relative to our reputation, our student successes, our commitment to collaborating with indigenous peoples to ensure that our partnerships and insuring programs meet the needs of the community we serve. He spoke about the Calgary campus of the University of Lethbridge. And he also spoke about the sustainability of the University of Lethbridge. There are some external factors which I want to bring to your attention. The primary one is the government of Alberta's 2030 review, which was done by the McKinsey company. In that context, improved access and strengthening, strengthening of the student experience is paramount. The development of skills for jobs is also paramount. And so are strengthening innovation and commercialization, improvement of inter internationalization and of course, the financial sustainability of the universities and the governance of the universities are all important. The government through the system review and through metrics will expect us to meet these metrics with the consequences of hits on the operating budget if we do not meet the bar of these performance indicators. At the same time, our vision, upholding the fundamental principles of the university, our strategic direction, and as Nancy indicated, our budget values, all our challenges and expectations that we have. And indeed, our communities expect us to educate global citizens, resilient and competitive citizens, entrepreneurs and leaders. These factors combined to give us pause relative to our vision, principles, strategic directions and budget values as a carry. Indeed, and I've said this before, there continues to be the need for reflective transformation looking at ourselves in the mirror, connecting the dots, what makes us unique and finding efficiencies of scale. Thus, the formation of 20 task forces. And these task forces have fundamental imperative, how to achieve our vision, principles, strategic direction, and budget values as a carry in a way which preserves our teaching, the quality of our research and reflects our unique character and history in an efficient and effective ways and indeed cost-effective ways to ensure that we remain sustainable. We did not want to have outsiders like others did like the U of A and the U of C having consultants do the transformational activities for them. We wanted our own community, those who understand our culture and values to think about recommendations across numerous areas. The areas reviewed by the task forces have been identified by you, our community. And this happened over the last year and including this year. What we heard was that there was nothing sacred and that all areas had to be considered and reviewed. These ideas came from in, in 2020, the 23 community meetings we had 
with the president and vice presidents to hear what people had to say. Please go back to the last slide, please. This is slide 14, and it shows the established budget process. This particular slide shows that the development of the budget is a consult consultation process with the university community and input received from numerous stakeholders. In yellow, you have the budget advisory committee and this is an advisory committee which does not have a decision-making authority. The terms of reference for the BAC is to provide oversight of the budget process and make recommendations regarding budget priorities and resource allocation that support the long-term financial viability and sustainability of the university. This particular figure shows the established budget development, consultation and approval process of the university's budget, which you can imagine engages many GFC members, including faculty and students through the mechanisms in the blue boxes on your screen. It means that the GFC Strategic Committee, the Statutory Dean's Council, VP Finance and Administration, Provost Council, and consultation with other stakeholders, including students, employee groups, and budget units are all involved. Their recommendations go to the President Executive Council and ultimately to the President for his approval and or rejection. And then we come to GFC for recommendations or approval dependent on the subject matter. If there are academic matters, it, they may flow through the relevant GFC processes such as CCC and ASC, et cetera. And these happen before uh, the budget is submitted to the Board of Governors for approval. If GFC finds in, in terms of the academic areas, then it flows back to BAC for further discussion. Given the extraordinary circumstances of last year's budget, we added mechanisms to seek additional work, data gathering and analysis and advice. And these are shown in pink on your slide. This included 23 open budget consultation sessions, town halls, and budget consultation processes with stakeholders which took place in 2020. The sessions included the budget process and participants were asked two questions. Are there any secret items when making budget decisions? And what budget decisions would you make if you were in our shoes? Indeed, the budget website was updated with the questions asked and the senior administrators' responses. Again, in pink, we formed the independent consultation committee with the responsibility to review and comment on the summary of findings of the task forces. We also formed the GFC Committee of the Whole. In a nutshell, the task forces were tasked to focus on gathering details and an analyzing of data exploring and providing opportunities and ideas to BAC. The ICC allowed for additional generative input on these ideas from members of each university constituent group, undergraduate and graduate students, academic staff, AUPE, APO, exempt staff, support staff, and senior administration. The GFC Committee of the Whole also allowed for additional generative input on these ideas from members of GFC. Next slide, please. No, the budget one, I think, yes, thank you. 
So what you have in front of you is the following 20 transformational task forces which were established and were established to assess the function to determine if there are operational efficiencies that can be implemented to reduce costs. They were tasked to explore the functions of governance models and potential modification to achieve efficiencies. They were tasked to review how professional and administrative services are structured and operate. They were tasked to explore mechanisms to build stronger collaboration and communication between units, remove unnecessary duplication of operations, review any possible program redundancies, and evaluate services and duties with a consideration of eliminating activities that are not institutional priorities. As you digest these 20 files in front of you, some would appear more or less tied to administration and organization, and some appear more or less tied to our academic mission. For the administration and organization task forces, examples will include the co-op, career services and applied studies, student affairs review, student advising, communication and marketing and web, and revenue generation. Relative to the task forces which are tied to the academic mission, examples include the faculty structures, study leaves, sessional term appointments, and assignment of duties, task forces, etc. The task forces final report, accompanied by the minutes and feedback written responses from the ICC and GFC Committee of the Whole, either collectively or from individuals, have been submitted to the Budget Advisory Committee. BAC met yesterday, June 21st, 2021, to begin the process of making its recommendation to the President's Executive Council, with the President having the final approval. Prior to the implementation of recommendations of the task forces, the appropriate governance processes will be followed as per applicable bylaws and governance documents. Let me state again, these are difficult times, but we'll always be guided as Nancy indicated, our budget values, our people defining our university as our greatest strength and the essential resource of our institution. Secondly, that high quality education is central to all we do and we will strive, paddle against the high winds to maintain high quality undergraduate and graduate academic programs, research and creative activity as important keys to our university's mission to build a better society. And again, as the president indicated and Nancy emphasized, access to our university is a foundational value as a comprehensive academic and research university dedicated to liberal education that was born out of the needs and aspirations of our local communities. Next slide, please. And again, our people, quality and access are remain priorities for us. Next slide, please. If you have any ideas relative to expense reductions or revenue generation, please visit the link as shown here. And in addition, there's a link to budget briefs, which tells you relative to uh, how we are dealing with the budget constraints and or revenues that we do have. Thank you so much for affording me the time to visit with you. Let me now hand you over to Kathleen Massey, Associate Vice President, Students. Good. Thank you very much, Erasmus. Good afternoon, everyone. Shortly, you'll see, uh, yes, a budget, uh, fall 2021 planning slide appear. I want to start first though by 
thanking the many members of the planning committees that have, who represent a cross section of the university, uh, including students and faculty. They've been working very hard uh, to plan for the fall. They've done a lot of work to get us to this point. I'm providing updates to you today on behalf of TJ Hansen and Dave Hinger, who uh, both chair um, committees that have been working to support this. And I'll be updating you regarding eight topics. And I think really what I want to do is start by saying that the university continues to prioritize the health and safety of the community. This has been the top priority throughout the pandemic. It has informed our planning every step of the way. Um, it has informed our actions throughout this period of time. And we will continue to follow the public health guidelines and directives as we have um, from Dr. Dina Hinshaw and um, others at Alberta Health Services. So I want to just frame everything that I'm about to share with you within that context. Uh, that this is uh, for our students, staff, and faculty, um, the key, um, your health and safety. Now, based on, um, you know, based on what we know today, and we listen to um, Dr. Hinshaw regularly, we are working toward the goal of a cl as close to a full reopening of in-person activities for this fall as possible. Uh, that at this moment in time includes about 90% of our classes are planned for in-person delivery. Um, our student residence is planned for 95% capacity. There will be in-person events. Athletics uh, will um, continue this fall. Performance and support services for students will be in place. Doors will be open. Um, so I, I do want to say that um, there will also be on-campus food providers. Um, that's planned for this fall on the Lethbridge campus. But the 90% um, in-person class delivery applies to both campuses. We're delivering um, in-person classes in Calgary as well as Lethbridge. Um, with regard to events, we're planning for a revised um, process where it will still be supervisor approved but there will be a series of guidelines to support um, uh, planning for those events and tracking of those events. But effectively approval will rest with the supervisor using those guidelines. Now, this, the third point I want to mention is when will the return to campus happen? I can tell you that, for example, um, student Affairs will open its doors to support students on August 30th, Monday, August 30th. However, for the campus community, we would like you to please plan to start returning to campus throughout the month of August, beginning in early August, and be ready to do in-person work on campus by September 1st. September 1st um, is midweek that week. That's so that we can um, ease ourselves back into in-person um, teaching, service delivery, and more. We have number four prepared guidelines. Um, the, you'll perhaps have seen the British Columbia guidelines um, that were produced. They were called a primer. Um, that primer, we've had a chance to review it. It's very well prepared. Um, and a similar edited version um, for specific to Alberta has been developed. Uh, we plan to release these guidelines, this type of collected set of guidelines to our own community this summer. Um, you know, this information is very much going to be informed as have all of our plans so far by the province's staged reopening plans uh, tied to um, you know, vaccination and hospitalization rates. So I'll just move down to the next piece and say that again, um, in terms of health and safety, we are absolutely encouraging vaccinations. The It's Worth a Shot contests are going well. We've had nearly 70% entrance from faculty and staff so far, and over a uh, over a third of students have entered, and we'll be boosting advertising for those con for those contests shortly. Um, 
In terms of health and safety, again, there will be health and safety plans to guide your planning to return to in-person work. HVAC, there was a recent HVAC um, update provided in U Weekly, which talked about the air quality facilities and operations, facility operations and maintenance provided that. It is um, uh, that the U of L has been proactive in ensuring our campus is safe for returning students, staff and faculty, and where possible, we've increased the volume of outside air that is provided in each building. Um, and it adheres to or exceeds uh, industry regulations and standards. So there's good work being done in that regard. Cleaning and sanitizing protocol, there continue to be, classrooms will be thoroughly cleaned and sanitized once each day and, um, and more. With regarding teaching and learning, I'll just say quickly that plans are, as I said, for most classes to be held in person. We estimate about 10% will be held online. We want to reassure you that the online teaching and learning tools will continue to be available this fall. That includes Zoom, Uja, Crowdmark, Moodle. So these will all be available to you this fall. Um, students will continue to need your flexibility, support and understanding as they make a transition back to in-person classes and activities. Notably, please remember that really medical notes should not be required if they miss classes. What we want everyone to do is do self checks. Um, don't come to campus if you're ill, get vaccinated ahead of time, but certainly um, not require them, not give the impression that they need to be here or need to be going to medical centers to get medical notes. Uh, please um, so continue to do the great work that you've been doing to support them and their success at the university. It's been important and uh, noticed and uh, it's made a huge difference. Finally, I just want to say that more information, including the guidelines, will be shared over the summer. We'll have updated FAQs on the website. Students will receive regular updates. We'll make sure the information is comprehensive before we, um, uh, so to allow you to continue to do your planning um, this, the, for this uh, return this fall. And again, thank you for everything that you've been doing um, to help us, help the university, help each other um, make our way through the pandemic safely. Thank you. Thank you to all the speakers. So Mike, Nancy, Erasmus, and Kathleen. So as we open up the question and answer portion of today's town hall, I did want to remind everyone that there's two ways to ask a question. So you can use your raise your hand and it populates you to the top of the attendee list. And myself as the moderator will call upon you and then your and audio will be enabled. So you can verbally ask your question. To submit a written question, please use that Q&A icon at the bottom of the screen. I'll be viewing these and we'll indicate who has asked the question and what the question is. If there are a few questions that are similar, I will try my best um, to amalgamate them together where possible. We will also switch a bit between verbal and written depending on where we get our questions from. And if you have your hand up and your question was answered, please just lower your hand. I'll also endeavor to hear from as many of you as possible. So if we've already responded to a question of yours verbally or written, we will look to see if there were others on the list that we would get um, that we could hear from and get back to if there is time. So at that point, I want to thank the, those people who are on the panel as well. We'll call upon a different people um, depending on what the question is. But our first question is from Maureen Hawkins, and she indicates that I know we're to open in person in the fall, but what will happen if Alberta gets a fourth wave of COVID, especially if it is the highly dangerous Delta variant? Thanks, I'll, I'll take that and uh, then offer up anybody else that wants to add. So um, I'll just reiterate what uh, Kathleen emphasized uh, in her presentation that uh, health and safety is our number one priority. And so as uh, we move uh, to um, uh, move back onto campus, we will be monitoring, of course, uh, what goes on on campus, but we'll also be monitoring what goes on in the community of Lethbridge and, and beyond. We'll be governed by uh, what Alberta Health Services and Dr. De 
Ina Hinshaw uh, direct. And so we will, we will uh, simply have to monitor things. And if we, if we indeed uh, face a fourth wave, we will have to make decisions as to how to best uh, move forward with that. I would say at this point, uh, we anticipate that, uh, you know, with the um, vaccinations that are taking place, or we hope I'll say, uh, with the vaccinations that are taking place that this won't occur, uh, but we will be prepared. And, and the only thing I will say uh, related to preparation is uh, this this would not be our first rodeo in terms of um, of uh, transitioning uh, to uh, less face-to-face. Uh, -face. And so we would uh, have to um, undertake the same uh, activities that we've undertaken in the past. Uh, but of course, we're crossing our fingers that uh, uh, the medical experts are correct in that uh, the balance between vaccination and even the uh, more virulent strains of COVID-19 uh, will uh, be managed through vaccination. So we'll, we'll, we'll hope for the best, but uh, as always plan for uh, various eventualities, which uh, we are certainly doing. Thanks for the question, Maureen, and thanks for the answer, Mike. We'll go to another written question. So James Marshall Say has asked, and this one's specifically for Kathleen, um, having student services ready for September means we will need the PSI guidelines by mid-July at the latest. Do you think that will happen? Uh, you know, so actually, I'll probably, I'll probably take that because uh, I'm the one who's uh, managing through the PSI guidelines, uh, both as president, but also as chair of COPOA. So what I'll say is COPOA has drafted the guidelines. Uh, they're done. They are sitting with uh, uh, health at the moment. I met with the deputy minister last week, uh, who indicated to me that uh, they anticipate having uh, these approved by the end of this month or early July. So I'm optimistic that we'll, we will meet uh, that, that timeline. So, sorry, Kathleen, for jumping in. You may have, have more to add, but I had sort of very recent information on this. No, that's helpful, uh, Mike. Thank you. Okay. Oh, Erasmus, did you want to add something? Well, just to add to what the president indicated, and if um, they, there's a delay relative to it, I mean, there is a sense that we will take the primer and work, uh, work with it um, for the University of Leverage ourselves, working as a university with the uh, health uh, leaders that we can work with. Yeah, and, and I guess uh, building on that, uh, we already have the primer. Uh, so we're actually following the primer as we speak. So uh, to be honest, nothing will be introduced when the primer is introduced that we don't already know about and are planning for. And uh, it follows very much hand in glove with what uh, BC is undertaking. So I think we're in very good shape for that reason. Okay, thank you um, for those questions and responses. We'll go to another written one. So we do have one here from uh, John indicating that um, my parking pass is scheduled to be renewed on September 1st and I do not have a pass at the moment due to working from home. If we can be on campus in August to prepare for September, can you explain what we will need to do for parking purposes? So I'll turn that over to Nancy who may turn it over to somebody else, but I'll, I'll start with Nancy who probably knows the answer to that. Thanks, Mike. Um, you should have received, all employees should have received an email about their parking passes to give instruction. But I think, you know, at the very least, just contact Campus Mobility. But I do have TJ on the line here. So I'm hoping that he might have a little bit more detailed information. There, can I be, am I heard? Yes. yes. You're back. Thanks. Uh, yeah, no, Nancy's entirely correct. Uh, the best course of action for that is to get hold of campus mobility through parking at ulef.ca. Um, they should have all the necessary information and instructions uh, in order to accommodate uh, whatever your needs are for August and September. Thanks, TJ. Thanks for the question. Thanks, uh, Nancy and TJ. We're going to go to a verbal question now. So we have uh, Brendan Cummins. And I think if you just enable your audio, Brendan. All right. Um, this is uh, this is in re regards to the to the, to the budget process um, that that you know is ongoing, and and in reference to the BAC process, I'm just wondering if uh, well, I'm not just wondering. I'm wondering 
whether the president or uh, vice president of finance can give us uh, a sense of when the university community can expect some sort of initial summaries or recommendations or findings on the volume of work that was done in the task forces, ICC and whatever else. Thanks, Brendan. Uh, I might, I'll, I'll start with uh, Nancy talking a little bit about the BAC process and then I can talk uh, about the um, process uh, related to presence exec and, and moving forward from there. So Nancy, do you want to start with BAC? Sure. So thanks, Brendan. We um, we had actually an all-day meeting on the budget task on the budget advisory committee yesterday to go through the recommendations or actually the options that were identified in the each of the task forces. So the budget um, advisory committee has has analyzed them. Um, they went through all the reports. It was um, it was a very thorough job. Um, that all of the task forces have done, and as you know, through the through the independent consultation in GFC, we did receive um, some additional feedback as well after sort of after all the reports were submitted. So people sort of tied together all of the other budget task forces. So the the budget advisory committee will be pre presenting um, a short our recommendations that will go forward to the president's executive um, and that will be in July. So I will turn that over to Mike now. Thanks, Nancy. So, so the process continues as Nancy said in July. I think we have an all day meeting on July 6th. Uh, at that meeting, we'll determine uh, a few things. Number one, if we um, have uh, a set of recommendations that we think uh, uh, we're comfortable with to move forward. Uh, those that require um, any recommendations that then require moving on to governance would uh, have to move on to governance this fall. Uh, you know, that would uh, presumably be uh, to GFC and or the board. Those uh, that are administrative decisions uh, would potentially um, un be undertaken prior to that in the latter part of the summer into the fall. Uh, communications as to both those sets of uh, of potential decisions, uh, the ones that don't require governance, the ones that do, will be, be communicated over the course, well, probably closer to the end of the summer into early fall. Uh, there may be some, uh, you know, earlier than that, but uh, um, recognizing that the summer is a time when uh, we also need uh, to ensure folks take some time off, uh, I would anticipate that more likely the latter part of the summer and then into the fall from a governance perspective. I will say, uh, based on the discussion we had yesterday, uh, it's quite likely that some of the more significant potential decisions, let's say related to faculty structure, um, may require a few more iterative steps around uh, back and forth uh, with uh, groups like Dean's Council and others. So uh, I wouldn't. I think it's important to to, to indicate that um, come July sixth, I don't foresee that we'll have. Kind of all the decisions made and off we go. I think it's going to be a, a more um, lengthy iterative process. Uh, we affirmed yesterday that the decisions that we ultimately uh, make really need to be thought through very carefully and so uh, we'll, we'll ensure that we take the time to do so. Thanks for the question, Brendan. Moving now to another written question from Lionel Magrino. He's asking, with respect to the new normal, there is uncertainty in the job market, especially for recent and soon to be grads. Is ULEF going to support students after they graduated during their transition period? Yeah, thanks, that's a great question. Uh, you know, I'll start off and then uh, maybe that uh, Kathleen and others mm -hmm. want to jump in. Uh, so one of the things I, I um, uh, talked about in, in my, intro comments was uh, the uh, the bringing together all of our uh, supports for students relative to uh, jobs and uh, work integrated learning and and employment and so that that's a very intentional set of activities to ensure that we do exactly that, that we support our students as they move through their education and and move on past their education uh, the extent to which we provide services past graduation i think is an interesting one uh, I'll turn it over to Kathleen. I'm not sure the extent to which we do that right now, but it is an interesting and I think important question because uh, certainly we do uh, see a very different employment landscape out there at the present time. And it's quite likely that that landscape will uh, continue to um, 
be more challenging than we've seen in many years. Kathleen, do you want to uh, jump in on that? Sure, I will, Mike. Thank you. I, I think Lionel raised this an excellent question and uh, one that we need to give. We already do provide some support to alumni. Um, even the My Experience transcript uh, could um, uh, be a source of support, that whole system that we've made available. But yes, we will help you. And I see Lindsay also from Alumni uh, Career Services will provide services. Uh, so yes, CareerBridge is well positioned um, and uh, students can make appointments uh, with career coaches to get support, including alumni, recent alumni. So yes, they can access our, uh, you can access our services beyond graduation. So please do. Thanks, Kathleen, and thanks, Lindsay. Yeah, um, just just to add to it, I, I raised my hand. Uh, there, the Provost Council. I mean, we're working with our, our colleagues at other universities. Are also trying to push the government relative to the changing landscape of employment. And one of their um, emphasis is skills for jobs. So the question now is, how do we begin to work with the industry relative to ensuring that? Um, the gap between the time they finish and the time they find employment is lessened and, uh, and, and mitigated by some of the policies and some of the um, policy instruments they may have. Those conversations are ongoing. There, yeah, and I'll just name, a, there are a couple other federal initiatives that we're involved with. Um, uh, one is the Business Higher Education Roundtable that has uh, received significant funding from the, the federal government to support uh, employment transition, and we've uh, worked with them. In fact, we just submitted a, a, a very significant uh, grant application to um, access uh, more funding uh, for those kinds of activities. And, and in fact, just tomorrow, I'm on a on a Zoom or whatever uh, with uh, the federal government on this topic as well. So I do I do uh, know that there are a number of initiatives out there federally and provincially, and and we're trying to tie into as many of them as possible to make sure that we can provide as many supports to both our students as well as our alumni going forward. It's an absolutely critical area. And so I, I really appreciate the question. It's a very important question. If, I, if you don't mind, I'll just add a little bit more information. We will have a career fair in the fall. And uh, so please, if you're um, a recent grad, if you're an alum of the university, please plan to attend. Um, that will be toward the end of September. So that's another opportunity to meet with employers. Thanks. Okay, thank you. And thanks again for the question, Lionel. Turning to Heather Harty, she has a question about, will the university be requiring a full return of employees 100% of the time, or will there be flexibility for those who can work from home to work, say, part-time in office and part-time virtually? Thanks for the question. So what we've um, uh, determined uh, at, at Presence Executive and, and communicated to our senior leaders and asked them to communicate uh, to managers, et cetera, is that uh, we will leave those decisions at, at the level of employee to, to supervisor uh, uh, discussions. Uh, we've indicated to uh, all of our senior leaders that uh, we would like to encourage on-campus participation uh, by employees and students because we believe uh, in the long run, the vibrancy of our campus is, is really supported by that. But we also uh, have said that we uh, want to ensure that our, our uh, managers and, and other leaders uh, are, are working with employees to determine if there are um, certain opportunities for employees to have a, a hybrid uh, of uh, some uh, on-campus and some on, at home. So we haven't come, come out with a hard and fast uh, uh, determination um, because we, we think that would get complicated. We'd rather leave it, uh, as I said, at the level of employee and, and supervisor to discuss. Thanks for the question, Heather, and, and the response, Mike. Moving to Jake Cameron, he has asked, will the university be maintaining any different standards for masking, social distancing, et cetera, than what is being or not being enforced by AHS? Will masks and hand sanitizers still be as readily available as, as it is now around campus for people who want to use them? Will we still be doing daily health checks? Many people are very worried about uh, returning to campus, regardless of what the government and the AHS regulations are recommending. 
Yeah, thanks for the question, Jake. So um, this is part of what we're working through uh, right now. Uh, we, um, I think it's safe to say we will encourage um, safety practices and health practices uh, likely beyond what Alberta Health Services may encourage. And so, uh, yes, we will be strongly encouraging uh, um, health practices around uh, hand sanitation, around um, having access to those sorts of things on campus. Um, it's unlikely we will require masking, but I think it's quite likely that we'll, we'll strongly encourage uh, masking, at least for the, the first semester. We're working through that, but I would say that's likely where we'll go. Uh, and we will encourage uh, as much as possible uh, folks to practice uh, physical distancing uh, when, and when possible. Obviously, uh, there are going to be some challenges in certain contexts for that. But, uh, you know, one of the things I've listened to the public health officials a lot about is uh, their thoughts on coming out of the pandemic and, and becoming more, uh, you know, sort of more back to quote normal. Uh, but they've also said, you know, they anticipate and hope that um, that the population will, we will all have learned through COVID uh, that we will all be healthier uh, and safer if we practice uh, many things that we've been doing for the last 18 months. Thanks for the question, Jake. I'm going to jump to um, another one here written that's kind of on that same line to see if there is anything additional we might need to add. But Alan Seroff has um, posed a question on, as you probably have seen, various universities in Manitoba are limiting in-person classes to smaller classes. It appears we are not, and so we should not assume that the students will be socially distanced in the classrooms, correct? Nor will they be required to wear masks, correct? Consequently, then, how should we run our classes to keep things safe? Yeah, thanks, Alan. And I did see the Manitoba announcement. I, I was, uh, I'll say, surprised because my understanding is that uh, across the country, the intent by the majority of, uh, of um, jurisdictions as well as universities is to be as fully back to campus as possible. Um, the, the work that is being undertaken by Kathleen and, and others uh, is very much to look at the the, um, you know, how best to bring students back safely and uh, questions around physical distancing in classrooms, et cetera. So I wouldn't say um, we have the final definitive answer on, on those uh, questions. Uh, we're working through them. We, we strongly believe, however, that if um, we can um, achieve um, maximum vaccination by the majority of our of our um, community that we will be in a position to be uh, more back to normal. And, you know, I think one of the things that uh, is important to recognize and what uh, the, the public health officials have acknowledged is, um, you know, once we're um, through the most difficult part of COVID and we're, uh, you know, we're moving towards, um, you know, significant number of people with double vaccinations, uh, COVID will still remain. Yes. And so we are going to have to, as a, as a world and as a community, recognize that and do our best to, to live um, within that reality by, by behaving um, as best we can from a health practices perspective. Now, Kathleen um, and others in your team, I don't know if you want to add to that. I think you've stated it well. I would just add that at this point in time, there are, you know, there are, we have um, developed some courses. Deans have made decisions about offering um, at least 10% of our courses online to provide some flexibility. Um, and uh, we continue to learn uh, as you do every day, uh, as new information becomes available, our decisions are based in the science that we're hearing about um, and the advice of our uh, of colleagues who are experts in this area. So uh, I think the universities remained flexible throughout the pandemic and will always prioritize health and safety. Um, the community. It is important to it is important to emphasize what uh, Kathleen and the president just indicated. The health and safety of our community members remains the top priority. Um, the assumption and hopefully the data will show that the transmission will be low, you know, come September and that uh, majority and as indicated by it's worth a shot, you know, encouraging our community members to get vaccinated 
so that um, it becomes, as President indicated, yes, the COVID will be with us. You know, I don't think it's, you know, but the question is how do we, um, in terms of um, it, it, it being one of the in, in infections that we do get from time to time, how do we live with it? And we try the very best we can relative to all the safety measures and health measures that we can. The health and safety of our community members remains a priority. Yeah, the only other thing I'll say is, uh, you know, we're, as, as I know we all appreciate, we're working through this in real time. And we have been for 18 months and we'll continue to work through this in real time. And uh, as things unfold, if, uh, if we need to make some uh, different kinds of decisions based on, um, you know, uh, concrete data, then we will um, step back and, and uh, take a look at that. So we are, we're not um, going into this uh, with uh, blinders on. We're, we're, we're um, you know, following all of the, the data, all of the, the uh, up-to-date information uh, so that we can make sure that we're uh, in, in step with what uh, makes sense from a public health perspective. Thanks for the responses, and, and I will, because we're kind of along the same topic vein. I will go through, um, Claudia Steinke has posed um, a question there, and I'll read it through to just see if anyone here wanted to add anything further from what you just commented in regards to return to campus. But the questions are, uh, why such a strong push to return to campus for the fall 2021? For example, as other universities such as Carleton advertise that at Carleton University, we are planning for several in-person courses and activities on campus in the fall, but we will also have online options to allow for maximum flexibility for students and staff. Preparations are well underway for a safe return to our beautiful campus in the fall, informed by health and safety expertise and following all public health guidelines. Barring future public health restrictions, we are optimistic for full campus operations with minimal restrictions in winter 2022. What people can expect? We are looking to offer as many in-person courses as possible. This means safely transitioning a significant portion of courses, e.g. sized classes under 60 students, to in-person learning. Also offering a high flex learning model for some courses, allowing students through the use of high flex technology and other arrangements, larger courses offered online. Um, continuing along there was also by Claudia, will the university continue to offer meetings and teachings, for example, to be accessed via Zoom or other remote form? Or is it the expectation that everyone will be on campus and return fully to in-person meetings and learning? Will the university ensure things, meetings, lectures, et cetera, are fully accessible, whether on campus or not? Yeah, I, I think we've we've addressed a lot of it. Yes. Okay. Um, but I, 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 w I would say that, uh, you know, whether it's Carleton, many, many universities are, are saying uh, very similar things in, with different words. And that is that, uh, you know, our goal is to be as in-person and on campus as possible, uh, respecting health and, health and safety, as uh, uh, was indicated in the presentation uh, by, um, I think, Erasmus or Kathleen, we will continue to have Zoom and all the other platforms available. And my sense is we will be in transition. There will be hybrid kinds of meetings, et cetera, because that, that uh, is uh, both an option and uh, in some instances may make lots of sense. So I think it's important to, to underscore that we are not going into this with hard and fast uh, rules that uh, we're going to follow. We're going into this um, trying to be as on campus as possible, but respecting uh, the realities that we faced over the next uh, few months. Uh, Erasmus or Kathleen, do you want to add anything to no, that? Um, no. No, I'm, that sounds good. Yeah. Okay. Thanks for the question, Claudia. We're going to switch to a verbal question. So I would like to call upon Tushar Patel and he can pose his question. Oh, thank you. So my question is for Nancy. Um, thanks for giving us nice budget uh, information. I was confused about how does the sponsor research fund gets incorporated to the oral budget? So my understanding is that once a researcher gets a grant, then the researcher recruits uh, a postdoc or a trainee from that grant and the salaries and wages come out from the sponsored research. So 
does it have any positive or negative impact on your overall budget? Um, and then following question was that in the table that you gave, you had um, four categories. There was general operating, ancillary operations, sponsor research, and there was also a category called other. So could you tell me what that other category involved? Sure, absolutely. Thanks for the question. So um, Tricia, so normally when the budget committee, the, the budget advisory committee concentrates almost exclusively on the operating budget. So when I give a lot of the stats, that's the first column that I had in that particular slide. And then we have ancillary services sponsored research. So as you said, um, most of the sponsored research, it comes to zero because we get the grant in and there's very, very specific conditions on what, um, what can be spent on the grant. So we actually don't consider that any part of our budget reductions because it, the grants are very specific to be spent on certain um, um, activities, as you said. The, the grant, if it, it, it allows for um, um, postdocs that you might hire or any kind of research or assistance, then that is that has no impact on our budget or budget reductions. The other column is um, scholarships and endowments where we have a lot of scholarships that we um, pay and, um, and that's where we categorize most of those um, funds in that particular column. The only thing I'll, I'll add, um, Nancy, and I'm blanking on the name of the fund, uh, but the, the total amount of sponsored research we receive from uh, the federal government impacts um, the amount of money we receive, it used to be called indirect costs of research. Now I'm, I'm blanking on the name of the, of the fund now. Research support so, fund. Research Thanks. support fund, yeah. And so Trushar the and others, um, as we see our funding, federal funding in particular increase, uh, that fund then increases. So that fund is reflected in our overall operating and does um, support in particular things uh, taking place in research services. Thank you so much. And the yeah. other message I posted was just for information that vaccines do help quite a bit. So that's probably the answer for a safe opening. <laughs> Thanks, Drew Shar. Thank, thank you, Drew Trushar, you have been a great advocate and, and uh, communicator around uh, the, the uh, pandemic. So we appreciate all of uh, the work you're doing in that area. Thank you for the question, Trushar. And I, and I will just write the comment that and read the comment for everyone that you did submit here, Trushar. It's saying is, of course, we need to wait for more details on the cases. But for example, in the UK, while just 26 people died after their second dose, more than 30.6 million have had doses and most are safe. We need to ensure that we continue wearing masks and follow the advice from health professionals until the number of cases are significantly down across the country and outside. So thank mm -hmm. you, Trisha. Now I'm gonna to move to a couple enrollment questions. So Mike Frank has posed to better enrollment, can we explore options where students and families have unique ULEF creative payment plans to accommodate students with cash flow challenges? Hmm. I can take that one if you okay. if you'd like. Yeah, absolutely. We always will pre um, will listen to students and and come up with the creative advices. We have that, and we've always done that. Please do not suffer alone. If you are a student, if you have concern, <laughs> our uh, again one of our budget values is access to education. If there's opportunities for some sort of payment plan, or if there's uh, you know a lot of our students get grants, but maybe they they come late. Um, we're certainly willing to uh, to work with every single student. So please, please call financial services um, or student affairs and um, we will see what we can do for the students. So thank you for that. Thanks for the question, Mike. Now, continuing with the enrollment question, Locke Spencer had posed a written question saying that um, he may have missed it, apologies, but can we comment on how we're looking at with respect to student enrollment for the fall? And maybe um, Kathleen as well, he um, did, and I know you had mentioned the numbers, but if you could just comment again on the uptake of students and staff who entered the Worth a Shot contest. Thanks. Sure. Would you like me to do, to respond to both? 
please. Yeah. Okay, um, I'll I'll just speak about the vaccinations first. The the campaigns, the student campaign. We have over two thousand eight hundred entrants in the um, vaccination. It's worth a shot campaign. That's more than thirty percent of the student body at this point in time. We're going to boost that campaign again right after the long weekend, um, and the uh, student union uh, ULSU is planning to join us in doing that, which is fantastic. I'm sure the GSA will as well. Um, staff and faculty, more than 65% have um, entered the contest already. Um, it's closer to 67% if I recall. So great take up on that one as well. And growing, they're both growing every day um, in terms of the numbers. So uh, great response to those and more to come, I'm sure. Um, with regard to enrollment, um, Things are improving on the enrollment front, which is great to see. And I think it's because of the work everyone is doing um, to um, support students in uh, getting back into courses and um, accepting their offers. On the new student side of things, um, we have more applicants than we did last year, which is great. Um, that's important. Um, registrations are still trailing a little bit by 2.3%. Um, that's uh, down by 178 compared to last year at the same time. Um, and the projection right now by institutional analysis is that we'll um, have 2% fewer students enrolled relative to our target. So uh, we're still working very hard to try and encourage students to get registered. And that, by the way, is not just new students, but also continuing students. So if you know of any continuing students in your circle who have not registered in courses yet, please encourage them uh, to register as soon as possible. Um, so yeah, that's how things look. Yeah, um, if I may, uh, Kathleen, you may talk about the fact that we want to, as it were, vaccinations on campus. That is one of the initiatives that you, you are working on. And the other aspect is that the improvements in enrollment is actually very refreshing because um, as Kathleen, you indicated to me, the improvements where we were 3.2 percent, you know, compared to last year, moved to 2.6 percent, uh, and now it's 2 percent. So every every week is good news, and it is predicated on all the efforts and work being done. And, and thanks to everybody who has been helping your team, everybody on 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 campus at the U of L, and uh, um, the Calgary campus, doing our very best to ensure vaccinations, as uh, Dr. Patel has indicated. But you could comment on the fact that you are trying to have even vaccinations on campus, please. Yes, absolutely. Um, we've applied through our health center to be able to give vaccinations uh, there. Um, perhaps also, I do believe that um, vaccinations, as Trisha has said, are, are the way through and out of this. Um, and so I'm a strong proponent. If you can get vaccinated, I, I hope you will. Um, I, but we will be offering that option for students on campus um, through the health center. And by the way, we're also applying to be able to do some um, um, rapid screening rapid screening in residence, in athletics, um, and in a couple of other areas. So we're working on a couple of those. I think confidence building activities like that are having an effect on enrollment as well. Thank you. Okay, thanks for the question, Locke. Now going to a question from Pre. Um, Pre Dett had asked, what are the expected tuition increases to each student group? So international undergrads, grads, local undergrads, um, and graduates. Mike or Nancy, do you want to take that one? And Nancy. Yes, absolutely. Thanks for uh, thanks, Pre. So I, I can't answer that question right now because um, uh, we do have to consult with students. I, um, for example, last year we had increases for undergraduate students. We had zero increases for graduate students. What we do is we look at the market and we look at what, um, you know, as well as our budget and our budget assumptions. I can say that we probably will have tuition increases, at least for the undergraduate for next year, just because of our budget situation and the, the, the reductions that we have to cope with. But um, in terms of the specific students, I can't actually answer that question right now, but we will certainly be in consultation with you. Okay, thanks for the response, Nancy, and for the question, Pre. So Carol Williams has a written uh, question she submitted. Can anyone respond as to how many faculty have departed? 
finding better offers in other provinces due to the current budget crisis. How will these losses impact our profile? So this is probably a, a Rasmus uh, yes. a question. Yes. I do not, thanks Carol, I do not have the exact numbers uh, relative to those who have departed. Uh, what we do have is, is the fact that, and I'm sure you know, uh, because not right now it should be, it should be um, general knowledge, that the retention of faculty is going to be, uh, especially the talented ones will remain a challenge for us relative to one, the increase in our reputation, and two, the fact that some of the big universities um, are targeting uh, some of our talented, um, uh, talented um, academic members. Um, you may have heard that at least uh, we've lost two, well, or two of our prominent uh, researchers to another university, and it wasn't due to lack of trying. We'll try very hard to create an environment to, to ensure that our faculty members stay here. But let's make no doubt about, let's have no doubt about it. Um, because of the increase in our reputation as indicated by the president, um, we will uh, be having people knocking on the doors of our talented researchers and we'll do everything we can, relatively speaking, to uh, keep, um, keep everybody here. Yeah, and if I can just add, um, I agree with all that Erasmus has said, and I would say that um, this is something that uh, all of the universities are pushing uh, hard on the government about that, um, you know, both, um, you know, highly qualified uh, faculty members, uh, administrators, you name it. Uh, the rest of the country is targeting Alberta, we know that. Uh, because they know that uh, we've had some challenges from a fiscal perspective. We're, we're trying to help the government understand that the further they cut us, the more challenging it's going to be to be able to maintain the excellence that uh, uh, the Alberta universities uh, like ours have become known for. So it is a big area of challenge that we're continuing to laud the government on. So there is a submitted question from Amy Mendenhall wondering about for those planning events for the fall, when will we find out guidelines that we need to follow as planning is already taking place? Um, I don't know if someone wants a global response and I can help and jump in if needed. Yeah, so globally, um, the, uh, the specifics around, um, you know, the, the guidelines will um, be uh, in part in the document that we've been referring to that uh, CAPOA has developed in collaboration with the government uh, based on the BC document. Uh, but then beyond that, we will we are in the process of, of establishing our more specific uh, guidelines around events, and that's a work in progress. Jody is, uh, is the person leading that process, so I'm going to turn it over to you, Jody, to maybe talk a little bit about what your group has been doing on that front. Yeah, thanks, Mike, and thanks, Amy, for the question. So our, our group has really been trying to um, keep track of what's going on and try to support the return of um, successful and safe events to campus. We, of course, throughout this last year, created a virtual event toolkit to try to support people virtually to understand what your options might be to still host events. And we've had some great success in events virtually last year. And I'd like to thank all those who have gone above and beyond to try to still do things. I mean, we awarded five honorary degrees this year virtually, which um, went seamlessly and the recipients were just really pleased. And, and we did do a lot of um, honoring of some of our own award recipients this year as well at the university. So we are, Amy hoping, Amy, hoping to get these guidelines out right away, to get a checklist as soon as we know a bit more about these things in place to say, okay, how can we support what you need to make sure we have, you have done? And if we kind of register the events, what we're hoping to do then is we can then reach out to those people and we know the activity on campus. So if something changes and, and some regulation needs to get put into place, we can easily reach out to event planners and say, hey, look, make sure we need to do this to accommodate a successful event. So we want to support wherever possible. But yes, we, we would like to get them out sooner rather than later. But feel free to register your event just so we know that you're working through things. And then we can update you once the guidelines are ready. Thanks for the question. So we have another written one from Ian Bennett. It was mentioned that approximately 10% of the courses will still be online. A few months ago, faculty were asked to submit potential courses which could be delivered online. When will faculty be made aware of their delivery model for each course? 
Thanks. I will. I think that's a Erasmus slash Kathleen question. So I'll turn it over to you two. Yeah. Would you like me to go ahead? Yes. Yeah, go ahead. Sure. Sure, I'm happy to say that, um, yes, uh, that information has already been published to students um, as part of the registration process. So students know um, what the mode of delivery is in terms of in-person or online. And so the Dean's offices will have that information and can share it with faculty members in each of. So I think the Dean's offices are really the best source for faculty to obtain that information about individual courses. Okay. And um, if you haven't heard from your dean, please get in touch with uh, um, the respective dean of the respective faculty, please. And the response. So moving to Scott Rathwell, considering the high likelihood of having, of having a hybrid model for at least another semester, will the university be more flexible with the support afforded to its staff when trying to work from home? Currently, we cannot use our professional development fund for home office supplies, despite working from home for over a year. Is it likely that we will now need two offices? I can take that. Um, thank you for that question. So I would like to clarify that um, professional supplement can be used for office supplies. Um, and, and that includes, um, you know, pens and papers, of course, but but also for computers, printers, um, any internet um, connections that you have. What professional supplement cannot be used for is furniture. And that is based on, uh, because it's a personal expense and that's the um, Canada Revenue Agency guidelines is they require that um, they say that that's a personal expense. We have to be very, very careful about preserving the entire program. We do get um, CRA auditors that review our professional supplement program. And because it's supposed to be used for work-related expenditures, we have to make sure that they follow the CRA guidelines. And the guidelines are very clear that furniture is not allowed. So that's why we don't allow that. We also, I'd like to add though, that we are having um, significant conversations right now on campus uh, with senior administrators, as in particular with IT, is how do we how do we allow people to have flexibility and work at home as well as the office? Now the question is, do do we provide computers in the office as well as at home, or do we go to laptops, for example, that you can move them um, from the home and the office? Laptops are certainly more expensive than um, desktops, but maybe that's the route that we have to go to allow flexibility for people. So there's a few things that we're working on right now trying to um, um, make it easy for people and flexibility so that they can work both at home as well as um, at the office. Yeah, thanks, Nancy. And I'll just reiterate what I said earlier that, uh, you know, we, we do want to leave it up to the supervisors to work with their uh, staff to figure out the model that uh, works best. We do, of course, want to have uh, folks on campus uh, as much as possible to, to ensure the vibrancy of the campus. But we want, also want to recognize that as we have come through COVID, we've all determined that there are flexible ways to work. And so we want to ensure that going forward, we support uh, that those levels of flexibility. I'm going to switch back to a verbal question, and we have Brendan um, waiting. So, Brendan, you could pose your question now. Uh, this is going back to the registration question, and you know, perhaps I'm sounding a bit like a broken record, but a lot of the communication about the return, the the plans for the fall have been vague. Um, with a lot of uh, sort of we hope to and we expect to and I realize it's a lot of the communication that's going on now. But speaking with second and third year students who took a class with me this summer, some of them are waiting to register until they get clear communication and direction from the university. When is the university planning on making students aware of the fall plans as well as staff? Kathleen. Okay, sure. I'm happy to answer that. Thank you, Brendan. I appreciate knowing um, that 
um, there's lack of clarity on that on the part of some students regarding that. So uh, we do plan to communicate with students on an ongoing basis throughout the summer, including putting more information at the website, but we're preparing to send an email note to them shortly. So I would say early July, and then again later in July, and then again in August. So it'll be ongoing throughout the summer to bring them up to speed. But I appreciate the feedback um, very much. Thank you. And maybe I can add to that, Kathleen, remember the, the hard work you're doing in terms of phone calls that you are making to over 700 students who may not have registered, you know, just to ensure that, yes, they know that there are plans afoot uh, relative to the fall. It is imperative for, for our community our community to understand that we are doing everything we can relative to communication. And I, I appreciate the feedback from Brendan relative to having to be more explicit as we move forward, taking into consideration the health and safety of everybody you know, on campus. Yeah, I would just underscore that that was the student enrollment team, including some students. So was, there were peer phone calls and staff phone calls uh, made to uh, students who had been admitted and had not accepted their offers and hadn't been registered yet. So it is to have those one-to-one -one conversations to provide reassurance, answer questions, um, and my, kudos, my thanks to the team. They're doing an excellent job having those conversations, but still appreciate the feedback. Um, those were the new students. You're referring to ongoing students uh, Brendan, so I appreciate that. Thank you. Okay, thanks again for the question, Brendan. So we have a written a question here again from Pri. So Pri has asked that given that there are several articles speaking to the benefits of a blended work from home virtual approach to professional settings, or the need for reduced work hours or work weeks, sorry, to support the mental health of employees, are there plans to provide mental health resources to faculty staff? What are the plans to support all groups on campus as we transition back? I can answer that, Pri. Thank you for the question. It's, um, I want to emphasize that, um, that yes, we do have um, support services for faculty and staff, all faculty and staff. It's our Employee Family Assistance Program. We've had it for years. We do have resources on campus as well as we have a contract with an external agency that can also provide um, assistance to people. I know it's difficult sometimes for people to know where they can uh, where they can get help. So please, again, contact us. Contact any um, whether it's human resources. Um, contact um, student uh, student affairs if you're a student, um, or contact the president's office, and we will direct you into the into the the proper um, channel so that you can get help. Kathleen can add to to that. Yeah, I could add a little bit of information related to students in particular that um, Dr. Mark Slump has negotiated an arrangement with Alberta Health Services to add four positions to the health center that are focused on mental health and addictions. And they are uh, being hired right now and will be in place for this fall because we do anticipate an uptick in demand and a need to provide support. Um, these positions are funded by Alberta Health Services as well. Um, so we'll be adding uh, capacity. And of course, we also have our counseling team available um, in uh, Anderson. So just wanted to share that information. Thanks again, and thanks Pri for the question. Yeah, so and if I can, can I just add one other thing, Jody? I just wanna underscore that, um, you know, as we work through this, uh, we've communicated uh, directly uh, with uh, all of our leaders and supervisors uh, about the importance of, of working closely with, with uh, faculty and staff to support folks as, as we all work through this. We know this is um, going to be a challenging transition on different fronts for all sorts of reasons. Uh, and so we do want to ensure that we are a supportive community of everyone that has to uh, go through this transition. It, you know, if we think about it on that front, is this going to be a huge transition for the world? Um, because so many in the world have been going through this in different ways. And so we all are going to have to recognize the importance of, of supporting uh, one another as we move through this. I'll just provide a comment. We did receive one through the question and answer, and I think it was back to the communication piece on informing students. And Christine Goodstriker just wanted to note that as a student, when... Um, registering on the specified dates, you can see which courses are offered on campus and or online. So thank you, Christine, for adding that. 
The next question we have is from Robin Bright. So Robin asks, it's my understanding that at this time, Lethbridge College is telling their teaching staff that they are not to conduct student meetings in their offices due to the close proximity involved of doing so. They are encouraged to have these types of meetings online or after class. Do we think such restrictions need to be in place? Thanks. Yeah, that's a great question, Robin. And I, I, I don't know, um, the actual answer to that, i.e. if we've uh, discussed that specifically, uh, I'll maybe turn it over uh, back to um, Nancy, uh, Kathleen, others that may have looked at this, very, uh, this specific question. I'm happy to just jump in a for a moment if you'd like, Nancy. Sure. Okay. Uh, just to say, we have discussed this at the planning committee and in, in the various working groups. And what we've learned is actually, irrespective of um, ongoing a need for, you know, uh, planning for um, safety measures, that um, online uh, appointments with students is turning out to be a better way to connect with them. We've heard from a number of faculty who have said office hours online has resulted in more students attending office hours and reaching out for support. So this might be one of those. I realize this isn't the premise of your question, um, Robin, but this might be one of those um, Thing, strengths, benefits that we've seen emerge from the COVID experience that might be worth carrying forward. Um, this idea of making the appointments more accessible by holding them online because students seem to feel less intimidated. And it may also be just generally more accessible because they don't have to drive to campus. Uh, they may have other demands, children, jobs and whatnot, uh, taking up their time. So I, I, I do want to just kind of emphasize there may be other reasons to, to take this approach. And the other thing I, I'll, I'll add is, um, to build on this is that we have also um, learned that our online uh, uh, student mental health supports have been taken up significantly. And so we do intend to continue those kind of supports into the future because we've learned that, um, yes, face to face is, is important. And we, of course, will continue with that. But some students have actually uh, accessed services because it's been online. And so um, COVID has taught us uh, a number of things about how technology can be helpful. And so we, we want to continue to build on those things. Nancy, I don't know if you wanted to add anything. Yeah, for in terms of staff, it's the same response, basically, that uh, we will leave it up to supervisors and there will be blended, there will be opportunities for remote as well as in person. So we have to play it by ear and, um, and see how the how the how things progress over the fall semester. Yeah, and I will say, uh, across your fingers, we have been trying throughout COVID to upgrade um, our um, the boardroom that we use for GFC and board meetings, et cetera. And so we're hopeful, cross your fingers, uh, all, uh, all those that are worried about whether in the end the IT will work, because it's always a challenge, but we're hopeful that we will have uh, um, a meeting room that has access for folks to join uh, virtually as well as in person. Thanks for the question, Robin. So we did have a attendee with a technical challenge and couldn't quite get the question submitted through their system. So the question is, when will realistically, when will budget information for 2021, 2022 be determined for and or shared with individual faculties, which is really a long way of trying to find out when departments will receive their budget information so that we can continue our work over the summer and into the fall. Yeah, I'll turn that to Nancy. I mean, that's uh, a process question, so Nancy. Sure. Uh, so be, because the board just approved it at the end of May, um, and um, we so it takes us a little bit of time and effort to to input the budget as well as to uh, determine the carryover. So uh, I don't actually have a date, but I can say it's it's um, imminent. <laughs> I hope that that answers it so soon. Thanks, Nancy, and thanks for the thanks for the question. So um, at this point in time, I wanted to do a last call to see if anyone had any other questions um, that they wanted to submit. And um, of course, the recording of a town hall, as we've done before, is made available and posted on our budget website. So I'd like to you know refer any of your colleagues and that that couldn't attend and, and wanted to view it, they can it will be posted um, and made available there as well. So I might wait for just a second to see, and then I would turn it over to Mike so he could wrap up.
So are we good to go, Jody? Well, I don't see any hands raised and there's, okay. oh, one has come in. Okay. So Pre has asked again, um, it's my understanding that um, School of Graduate Studies has postponed the reviews of extensions. Should students expect their extensions to be approved? Uh, Rasmus? Well, yes, I, I wouldn't be able to answer that particular one relative to extensions. I can imagine that um, uh, no reasonable request will be will uh, will be denied, um, but I don't have that particular information in front of me to answer it directly. But what we can do is uh, we'll note this question and mm -hmm. make sure that uh, Jackie provides an update on that uh, back to uh, uh, UPRI as well as uh, um, uh, graduate students. So mm -hmm. we'll make sure that, that that is followed up on. Okay, thank you for that and thank you, Pri. So at this time, I'd like to say thank you to everyone and I'll turn it over to Mike to say some final words. Great, well, first of all, um, I'd like to thank uh, Jody uh, for being the moderator and doing such a great job. Thanks to our team who has been uh, online um, uh, presenting uh, Erasmus, uh, Nancy, Kathleen, as well as providing uh, lots of uh, great input on, on the answers. I, I'd especially like to thank all of you for attending. We had at, at one point uh, close to 500 folks that were online. And so um, we appreciate being able to connect with you and uh, give you as many updates as possible, both in terms of the budget as well as COVID uh, and uh, the future, uh, the fall. I'll just uh, finish off by once again, thanking all of you for the work that you've done over these very, very difficult months over this past year. I know it's been challenging and, and I know many of you have stepped up to deliver, but uh, at times uh, it's not been easy. And so I thank you for all of your efforts. I do um, encourage everyone to take a break over the summer. We all, I know are tired and need a rest. And so I'll uh, encourage everyone to get that rest, get some downtime, have some fun over the summer, and we'll look forward to being together in the fall and uh, as much as possible together in person. And uh, if you're not vaccinated, I strongly encourage you to get vaccinated. Encourage your family and friends because the more uh, we're all vaccinated, uh, the safer we will be as a community. So with that, I'll just again say thanks everyone for coming and have a good rest of your day and have a great summer.